On New Year's Day, a tree snail called George died in a terrarium in Hawaii at the ripe old age of 14. And while the death of a single snail might not seem like the kind of thing you're gonna make a news show about, George had been the last known Acatinella apex fulva for more than a decade. So that death marked the first extinction of 2019, and with the way that things are going, it will not be the last. George the snail spent its entire life being cared for by biologists, a fate now shared by dozens of its close cousins. There were once over 700 species of land snail in Hawaii, including hundreds of Hawaiian tree snails that, like George, feed on the fungi, algae, and bacteria that grow on leaves. When British explorers first came to the islands in the 1700s, they described clusters of colorful snails hanging from the trees. But many of those are now gone, thanks to centuries of human harvesting and the introduction of the snail-eating rosy wolf snail in the 1950s. By the late 90s, scientists studied studying Hawaii's native snails realized that dozens of species were on the brink of extinction, so they established a captive breeding program. And in 1997, the last ten or so wild snails of George's species were all taken to the lab at the University of Hawaii. Tree snails take five to seven years to mature, and after mating, each pair of snails gives birth to less than ten babies annually. So captive breeding was slow going. And then, in the early 2000s, most of them just die. Only one juvenile survived, and it was nicknamed George, after Lonesome George the tortoise. Though researchers searched for over a decade, they never found another apex fulva. So George's death marked the end of an entire species. And if that's not sad enough on its own, it's just the latest in a string of extinctions, especially in snails and slugs. If you look at the known extinctions that have occurred since 1500, about 40% are land-dwelling mollusks. Worldwide, scientists estimate more than 600 snails and slugs are now extinct because of habitat destruction, climate change, invasive species, and even tourism. And in 2017, scientists used the group to calculate the likely extinction rates for all animals over the next century and a half, and it does not look good. Their estimates suggest that we could lose 5% of all species each decade, which means half of all the animals on Earth could go extinct in the next 150 years. As devastating as that is, such dire predictions assume that we stay on our current current path. The biologists that worked with George have emphasized that there are lots of species we can still save, including many of George's cousins, if we turn things around sooner rather than later. And not all species are barreling towards extinction. A new paper in the journal Frontiers in Marine Science has found that some Antarctic species might actually benefit from climate change. They did a risk assessment analysis to estimate how dozens of species will likely fare in the next 50 years or so, depending on how fast the Antarctic warms. The scientists first trawled through a ton of academic literature to come up with seven environmental factors that would most strongly affect Antarctic species. Stuff like rising temperatures, ocean acidification, and melting sea ice. They then found research which could speak to how each factor would impact a given species. If it was a positive effect, the species would get a plus for that factor. If it's negative, a minus. And if neutral, then it scored a zero. Then they tallied these up for 31 Antarctic species. The vast majority of the 20 21 invertebrates they studied, 70% would likely benefit from climate change. For example, less sea ice means more sunlit water where plant like phytoplankton can grow. That means more to eat for suspension feeders like clams and jellies. And as the ice breaks up, it tends to drift into shallower waters and scrape the seabed. That's good news for bottom feeders like the proboscis worm and cold-loving sea stars, which would be able to spread out and gobble up any organisms killed in the process. What was really surprising, though, was that about half of the ten bony creatures studied may benefit a little too, at least indirectly. The king penguin, for example, might have more room to breed because the receding ice would open up space on the glacial plains where it loves to nest. And both the king penguin and the southern right whale might do better because their main food sources, small fish and crustaceans, feed on plankton blooms and are therefore predicted to increase in numbers. But, and this is a pretty big caveat, most of these animals will also lose a major source of food. Krill. That could mean the end of species like the Adelie emperor and chinstrap penguins, as well as humpback whales. Also, even if an animal benefits in a big way in one category, like food availability, they might lose out in another, like having good habitat available. And scientists don't yet have a totally clear understanding of how the environmental factors interact or influence one another. So while a species might get more pluses than minuses in a risk assessment, they might not do so well in real life, especially 
if some of those minuses turn out to be bigger than some of the pluses. One thing is certain, a lot will change as the planet warms. The Antarctic ecosystems forged by climate change will look very different from what we see today. And I don't know about you, but I like penguins. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow News, and a special thanks to our president of space, SR Foxley. You're the best, SR. We really appreciate your support and the support of all of our other patrons on Patreon. If you want to be as cool as SR and help us make episodes like this one, you can learn more about becoming a patron at patreon.com slash scishow. And if you want to stay up to date on all of what's happening in the world of science, tune in right here every Friday.